Today we visit the Royal Show to find out why women don't have a more active role down on the farm. The lady who's both a farmer on the urban fringe and a countryside commissioner. And Heather Angel who's carved out a career taking stunning pictures of rural areas and the natural world. Hello. Today, a bit of a role reversal because we're considering the place of women in the countryside. While women have been accepted as equals elsewhere, they still seem to be playing second fiddle in rural areas. Happily, things are changing and we'll be meeting some country women who've made it to the top. But many inequalities still remain. For instance, we'll be looking at the problems faced by working mums in the countryside. And I'll be talking to Anne Mallison again, who's brought in some more items from a collection showing us the role of women in the countryside in the past, as well as telling you what last week's item was for. But first, though, farming. At present, it's still the major employer in rural areas. But traditionally, it's been an extraordinary chauvinistic industry. And it's slow to accept that women have a contribution to make. A visit to any livestock market proves how male-dominated the business world of farming is. There's usually an unbroken circle of male faces around the ring. But apparently times are changing even down on the farm. And to find out more, Fiona went along to the Royal Show last week in Warwickshire. The 1992 Royal, the most important event in the farming calendar. It's a show dominated by macho images, where bulls take pride of place and boars and rams compete in the ring. All around are the signs that it's a man's world, where women, it seems, play second fiddle. Traditionally, they've been the sort of general factotum. They've had to look after the husband on the farm, feed the calves, feed the chickens and, and look after the children. On the face of it, this year nothing's changed. The men are here to talk business and show off their stock to the judges, while the wives look on and enjoy the sun. And the women that do work, often their hostesses, paid to smile and promote a product. But there are signs of progress. Over at the NFU stand, they're beginning to realise that women can offer more than tea and sympathy. There's no doubt that it was a male preserve for a very long time and inevitably, therefore, the image is one of being a male preserve. I hope we're doing a lot, not just specifically to break it down, but to make people realise the benefits of having both women and men involved in this all-important industry of ours, which, which depends on its end customer. Fine words, but there are still only three women on the union's governing council of over a hundred. However, the union's head of PR is a woman, and she's annoyed that it's taking so long for this bastion of middle-aged men to change. It's absolutely essential that women actually take part in the political processes within the NFU, because it's they that take their children to school, it's they that visit the shops and the supermarkets, it's they that know what's talked about, and it's they that, that understand some of the problems um, that women have about farming. Meanwhile, the band plays on, and ironically, it's Hello, Dolly. Nice to have you back where you belong. Well, one group that are happy to maintain the status quo are the Women's Farming Union. They believe women have a different role to play and that feminine skills are needed, not macho politicking. Women from all over the country representing different kinds of farming commodities wanted to do it our way, with us, because we felt we had a very sympathetic voice. And somehow, also a woman's voice, it's extremely easy to get through to the people we want to talk to. Hardly any barriers. But, it, but aren't you still being the, the second-class citizen in a way, because they, they have the political power? No, we have the political power, and we've never been second-class citizens. Of course, farming isn't the only industry in the countryside. Because the sleeve can be pushed up the arm. Julian Akers Douglas from Lewis is just one of the people who set up her own business. In her case, it's smocks, and many other rural crafts are making a comeback. Here, women are at the forefront of change. It's something that the magazine Country Living, with its predominantly female staff, has latched onto. Women are coming through in the most positive way possible. Um, they're having to juggle their lives. They have children, they are running businesses, they are becoming more and more independent, and they have to do it in a very flexible way because it's very difficult to have children and go to work. And I think it's this flexibility and this ability for women to think of more than one thing at a time, which I have to say, I'm sorry men, but they, they're not very good at it, um, that is going to make women a much more powerful 
uh, voice in, in the workforce in the future. And I'm very optimistic for him. At long last, it seems that the days of brute strength, beef and bullishness are coming to an end. At this year's Royal, maybe some women are still put out to grass, but there's a new generation coming who are quite determined they'll be on top. Fiona in, used to be in, in what used to be a man's world. Well, while farmers' wives are trying to play a bigger part in the family business, wives in working-class families are having an even tougher battle, and it's got more than one group in a campaigning mood. Women's struggle for equal conditions officially started in 1899 with the foundation of the Women's Farm and Gardens Association. But it was the formation of the Women's Land Army in the Second World War that finally proved that women could do a man's job and that they deserved equal pay and conditions. But after the war, things slipped back again despite Equal Pay and Sex Discrimination Acts of the 70s. Now, legally, employers have to pay men and women on the same grade equal rates. However, many employers get round this by putting women on a lower grade. The result is that although women make up 44% of the workforce, they earn on average 22% less than men. The situation in the countryside is even worse, says the National Alliance of Women's Organisations. But it's not just pay that pressure groups are complaining about. Barry Leeswood of the Agricultural Section of the Transport and General Workers Union highlights the need for transport to get women to work. He says buses in rural areas are infrequent and expensive and if there is a family car, the husband takes it to work. The union also cites training and childcare as other important issues that hold women back. Joanna Foster at the Equal Opportunities Commission agrees. Child care in rural areas is non-existent, she says. It's important because women used to go crop picking and take their children with them. Well now the Children's Act says children aren't allowed in a workplace where machinery is operating. One enlightened farmer is Chris Anstey, who set up three creches on farms in Kent for the children of seasonal fruit pickers. But without help from the council, neither he nor his pickers could afford to pay for the day carers, and they all had to close. And if all this wasn't a big enough barrier to women finding work, many farmers nowadays are turning to overseas students to fill their seasonal labour needs. It seems if you want to be a working mum in a rural area, you've got a tough fight to find work, let alone work that pays a man's wage. Well, while generally there's a struggle for greater equality in the countryside, some women are making their opinions heard. One of them is Sarah Ward, a farmer from Kent, who's just been appointed a countryside commissioner. The Commission advises the government on countryside issues and instigates initiatives on countryside protection. Well, David met up with her on the North Downs. On the hills above Wye in Kent, the Countryside Commission is relaunching the North Downs Way. One of its most recently appointed commissioners is Sarah Ward. All the national trails are very much the showpieces of the Countryside Commission. And of course they're marvellous. They go through some of the finest country in Britain. They're very well maintained. You can enjoy yourself and perhaps get to know the countryside in a way that people used to do. Sarah Ward's well qualified to speak on countryside issues. She's both a countryside commissioner and a Kent County councillor. She also finds time to run a large mixed farm near Dartford on the southeastern edge of London's urban sprawl. Sarah knows all about balancing the competing demands on our countryside, both for food production and also as a playground for city dwellers. And she understands the pressures for change. I here am the last farm in the village. When I was young, there were six or seven farmers in the village. And of course, we are only 19 miles from Charing Cross. We're in the first original designated green belt. And so I do feel we're in the front line of change. The Countryside Commission doesn't just open up long-distance footpaths like the North Downs Way, it also administers schemes to enhance the beauty of the countryside. One of them, aimed directly at farmers, tries to preserve traditional landscapes. The stewardship scheme is essentially a conservation scheme to preserve and restore some of the finest landscapes. Because you can, a landscape, after all, is in the distance as well as when you're in it. In fact, sometimes the landscape looks a lot better from a distance. And so stewardship will enable people to preserve those landscapes. Stewardship should also encourage the return of a lot of the native 
birds and flowers that we've been missing with the with modern farming practices. And Sarah Ward's happy to share the splendours of her surroundings with urban visitors. Apart from the public rights of way, she's also established access for horse riders. But increased access creates new difficulties like dogs worrying sheep. Litter is another problem, especially around here. You sim it's quite hard for me to understand how people can come and dump builders' rubble and the debris from their decorating and old furniture they don't want in what is essentially very beautiful scenery. And also people don't know enough, I think, about crops and landscape to realise that what they might think was just a field of grass is actually food. And it's our living, in our case, it, it's our only source of income. Farmers haven't always been so enlightened, and to have one in their ranks who's so forceful and clear thinking is a breakthrough for the Countryside Commission. They've had a very bad press. I think it's a pity that uh, environmentalists have set farmers up as villains, because actually farmers know a lot more about the countryside than almost anyone else. Meanwhile, back at the relaunch of the North Downs Way, delegates have a chance to walk to one of its best vantage points. The Devil's Kneading Trough is both a nature reserve in its own right and a favourite local beauty spot with views across miles of open countryside. It's a natural treasure that Prof Bryn Green of Wye College appreciates. There is no doubt at all that the English countryside is by far the most attractive countryside in the world. Uh, not only is it visually attractive, but of course we have greater uh, access to it than almost any other country. So we're extremely fortunate. And access to rural areas is something that Sarah Ward wants to see more of. As she's demonstrated on her own farm, she wants people to enjoy the countryside. But she also wants townsfolk to appreciate the countryside is where farmers work and live. I think access must come. We've received public subsidy for a long time. I think to refuse the quiet enjoyment of the countryside would be churlish, out of date and ungracious. But I do ask people to remember what a wonderful farming industry they've got. And don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Well, time for another trip down memory lane now with some reminders of women's roles in days gone by. Anne Mallison has come into the studio to talk to Bob Farrer and she's brought with her some items from her rural museum in Selborne in Hampshire. But can you guess what they're for? Hello. Now, before I talk to Anne again and all her little bits and pieces, we've got last week's item to deal with. Now... If you remember, it was like a pair of pinchers and it was actually used by a wheelwright for squeezing the spokes together so that the fellows would fit on neatly with the little holes going onto the shanks on the, on the top of the spokes. Now, we've got quite a few correct answers. I think a lot of you must be related to wheelwrights because some of you put quite a lot of detail in. Anne, please pick out a winner. That is lovely. The tool is a spoke dog used for lining up spokes, ready to fit the fellows, adjustable to fit the spokes of any size wheel. That's lovely, isn't it? Now, that is from uh, Melvin Smith from Wittisham near Tenterton in Kent. Well done, Melvin. You win our prize from last week. Now, Anne, the role of women in the, in the past in the countryside, heavy work was not some of it. Yes, it was indeed, yes. Um, let's start with Monday, wash right. day. Right, wash day, yes. All right. <laughs> Here we have uh, a dolly tub and a dolly peg. The washing was put in here and away we went. You had to have jolly good muscles because this had to be moved up and down and round and round uh, so that the clothes got washed. So it was really quite hard work. And then there was the scrubbing board attached and for scrubbing the clothes. But this movement, again, goes on into the butter making. Over yes, there. and this is an, another pump up and down Which action. Is, yes, now if mm. I lift it out, you can see the plunger at the bottom. 
and that's what makes the cream wash backwards and forwards and helps it coagulate and makes the butter. Now, obviously, the poor woman, when her day's work was done, she retired to the kitchen with a candle. What did she do then? Well, at the end of the day, uh, they, there was their needlework. And here we have examples of crochet, uh, lace making and stitching. Uh, one of the most important things for the children, the girls, were work like this, Aunt Sarah, and that was stitch work. Again, another here, another little piece, beautiful work. But the most important item was the sampler. There you have one over there, two in fact over there. And this was the example of uh, girls stitching. And uh, it was very important because she showed that to her future husband. And uh, if he thought she was a good stitcher, then she had a chance of being married. So well, very I important. Now this poor girl, uh, I don't know what her future husband would have thought, but she ran out of space and she's got such and the mupla is she's had to do it above it yes. to fit it in the material. That's gorgeous, isn't it? That makes it so much more interesting. Yeah, jolly good. Now, we've got to have for next week a what's it for. Now, what would you suggest? I think I'd go for that item. <clears throat> now, that's a lovely little thing, isn't it? Made of wood, pinches, obviously. But what for? I will tell you this, they'll be much more useful at this time of the year than any other. Now, I want you to write in your answers on a postcard, please. And for the winner, there's a copy of this book, Sent in the Garden by Francis Perry. And the address to write to is Countryside Close, TVS Television, Vinters Park, Maidstone, Kent, ME14 5NZ. That's Countryside Close, TVS Television, Vinters Park, Maidstone, Kent, ME14 5NZ. Thanks, Bob and Anne. Well, from stories of days gone by now to the latest news from the countryside of the South, Fiona's been seeing what's happening, and here she is now with the latest. <laughs> Well, the controversy over the transport of live animals continues. The RSPCA has released new evidence that laws are being regularly flouted. Journeys from Holland of up to 60 hours with no food and water are commonplace, causing great stress for the animals involved. The RSPCA are calling for stronger directives on travel to go to the European Commission. And a new programme to help small businesses has been launched this week by Hampshire Training and Enterprise Council. The Small Business Campaign is part of the new Horizons for Businesses initiative and pledges to provide support to 500 companies in the region in the next 12 months. The grain harvest is also underway and while farmers are expecting a bumper crop, a leaked government report says organic farmers will make little or no money. The Soil Association, who set organic standards, are devastated by the findings. They argue that most modest government subsidies, in line with those received by conventional farmers, could make organics profitable. And the problems for organic growers will be highlighted in the first ever Whole Earth Show, to be held in Maiden Newton, Dorset, this weekend. Another topic that will be under discussion is natural health. Last week, local health authorities published figures showing that asthma attacks and respiratory disorders in the East Thames Corridor are getting worse. Air pollution is the problem and the local authorities place a major part of the blame on too many new industries. And finally, for those of you who are feeling healthy enough, the World Wide Fund for Nature are holding a national pedal for the planet this weekend. So, for nature's sake, get on your bikes. Haven't we had the get on your bike joke before? Well, we have, but we should have it more often. It's a very good thing that they actually do these bike rides, I think. Yeah. Make us all a lot more healthy, won't it? I'm sure so. Yeah, I want to get one. See? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, another lady who's made quite an impact in rural areas is Heather Angel. She's a self-taught photographer whose stunning pictures on wildlife and landscapes have been widely acclaimed. Liz Wickham caught up with her on a latest assignment. I'm going to take you today to a site where um, I was working last week where there are masses of poppies growing over disturbed ground. They, they've been doing road workings in the area for some time. And poppies are plants that come in when, when the ground's been cleared. And I saw them and it was quite magical. I thought I was going to go for half an hour. Two and a half hours later, I was still shooting them.
to do. The light is uh, really what I call a sort of uh, soft, um, hazy sunlight coming through a light cloud cover. This isn't necessarily a bad thing. The, the only slight disappointment is that the poppies have very hairy stems. When I was here before, very early in the morning, I, I photographed them backlit and the hairs glowed. And that's very exciting. But really, the, the thing about Britain and its unpredictable weather is that you never know what's going to happen. And, and some days are better than others. But uh, I, I think this is part of the fun of working in Britain. Yeah, even though it's, the sun is not as bright as it might be, you can't fail with these. They're so lovely. Oh, wait a minute. Hang on. I've just seen, you know, there's a bit of grass in there. I'm going to have to move that because it's spoiling my picture. Um, it's little details like this which can make or mar a picture. In that way, it just, yes, simplifies it. And the eye concentrates on the poppies. Such enthusiasm and attention to detail have helped Heather become one of this country's leading wildlife photographers. Almost nothing in Britain's natural world has escaped her camera. Heather's photography has now become big business. At her studios in Farnham, the library runs to a quarter of a million slides. And her pictures are in demand for books, magazines, advertisements and TV companies all over the world. Nowadays, most of Heather's working time is spent abroad as she continues to search for new and exciting images for her camera. Her diaries bear testament to her travels. I've worked uh, really all over the world and um, uh, I've had some quite hairy experiences. I've had some uh, very moving, very beautiful ones. The recent trips I've made to Canada and Alaska, working very much up in the north where it's very cold, doing polar bears, very exciting. One of the most magical was when the sun went down and it was reflected off the ice and uh, there was the bear backlit. Beautiful, beautiful. And then another day they were fighting and playing and so on. Um, brown bears catching salmon I've done in Alaska. That's fun. Um, Africa, obviously, I, I go a lot to, but so do other people. That's perhaps not so original. Whale watching, I do a lot down in Mexico. Um, really, you name it. I, I don't sort of uh, uh, miss very much. Wh whatever turns up in front of my lens, I'll take. about the composition and lighting. You know, look beyond where you're focusing and see if there's anything distracting. And in that way, I think you'll gradually build and, and, and get better and better pictures. Photography should be fun. It shouldn't be a chore. And if it is a chore, then forget it. But to me, I get just as much excitement when the films come back from processing as I did in those very early days when I, when I first saw them. Heather Angel and her stunning photographs. Well, that's about it for this program. Next week at this time, we're considering some conservation issues. We'll be looking at a new charcoal industry that aims to help preserve some of the South's coppiced woodland. Also endangered chalk grasslands. Once they were at risk because farmers were plowing them up. Now they're in danger because they're not being farmed and how to recognise bird life while you're out for a walk in the countryside. We review a new guide to bird spotting. And I'll be looking over some more rural memorabilia as well as telling you what this interesting little pair of squeezers were for. And just to please David, <laughs> one of Anne's indications of how hard women worked in the past was the yoke. Wow. And this is what the dairy maid brought the, brought the milk in with. I don't think I'd be able to do that. <laughs> You were this surprisingly comfortable, actually. But at least the yoke's on Bob. Oh, oh God. Dear. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> not good enough. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.